entered the third year of the Civil War. It declared that all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. But it applied only to states designated as being in rebellion, not to the slave-holding border states of Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri or to areas of the Confederacy that had already come under Union control. The careful planning of this document, with Lincoln releasing it at just the right moment in the war, ensured that it had a great positive impact on the, on the Union efforts and redefined the purpose of the war. The Emancipation Proclamation continues to be a symbol of equality and social justice. In one regard, January 1st, 1863 was no different than all the other New Year's days in recent Washington memory. Civil War notwithstanding, ushers threw open the doors of the White House around 11 a.m. and ordinary citizens surged inside to mingle with dignitaries. Towering above the throngs was Abraham Lincoln, patiently greeting visitors by the hundreds, his blessed pump handle working steadily. But this was to be no ordinary New Year's Day in the nation's capital. Today, history would be made. Around 2 p.m., the president quietly slipped out of the East Room and walked upstairs to his office on the second floor. Waiting for him was Secretary of State William H. Seward, along with Seward's son, Frederick, who served as his father's private secretary and a few members of Lincoln's staff. On the large table near the center of the room rested a vellum document written out by a professional engrosser and corrected a final time only hours before after Lincoln himself noticed an error. Solemnly, Lincoln sat down at his accustomed spot at the head of the table. Now, at last, he would sign the most important order of his administration, <coughs> perhaps of the century, the Emancipation Proclamation. Welcome. My name is Ingrid Askew, and I will be your mistress of ceremonies for this afternoon's program. Here we are, 150 years later. <coughs> And still a lot of work to be done, right? Um, I'd like to ask Brother Keith Middleton from the Hope Community Church. Um, and I may add that Hope Community Church, a multi-racial, multicultural church, right here in the valley in Amherst, just celebrated its 100th anniversary. And and so I think it's very, very fitting that this choir, this gorgeous choir, be here, present, sharing their gifts with us today. So thank you very much for being here. And so Brother Keith Middleton, could you please come up and um, bless this event? Um, thank you. Just come with me into his holy presence. Father God, we come humbly and with great gratitude before thy throne of grace and mercy this morning. Father, we come in unity as one in one accord to say thank you for the movement of your holy hand some 150 years ago when you moved the hearts of your children to pass a bill that would begin the end of one of the cruelest, most insidious diseases that has ever attacked this planet. Father God, we know that it was a beginning because in this present day we live and we still struggle to understand the power of the love that you share for all of us one and all. So we ask right now, in the precious and holy name of your son Jesus, that you would continue to move the hearts and the minds of your children 
right now in this present day in 2012 and further and into the future, Father God, help us to understand the power of love for one another, the unity, the power that's in it, and the weakness that comes with separation. Father God, help us come together as one in tolerance and understanding and even healthy curiosity for each other's differences. <clears throat> Father God, we come together right now in the precious name of Jesus because we are tired of struggling and fighting with one another. Show us how to love one another with your precious love. In the precious and holy name of Jesus, your Son, the Christ, and our salvation, we pray. Amen. Terms it in the trial power, a craven soul is he. I am an abolitionist, and urge me not to pause, for joyfully do I enlist in freedom. strife the world near saw, the enslaved to disembowel. I am a soldier for the war, whatever may befall. I am an abolitionist. Oppression's deadly foe. In God's great strength will I resist and lay the monster. God's great name do I demand, to all be freedom given, that peace and joy may fill the land, and songs go up to heaven. I am an abolitionist. No threat shall all my soul, no perils cause me to desist, no bribe. Free man will I live and die in sunshine and in shade, and raise my voice for liberty. But not on earth, pray.
today, but um, I would be remiss in closing this um, gathering without mentioning um, the people from our committee. Um, and so I'm going to read the names, okay, and pass them to the blue stand. And I'm going to start with the evening last, but I'm going to call Linda Zaire, because this young woman one who called this committee together. I got an email from Reynolds Winslow. Reynolds, can you stand up, please? Um, saying that something had to be done, some kind of event had to happen. And, um, and anyone that's interested, would you please come to a meeting? I immediately called Carly, my friend Carly Tarko, Carly Stanley, and said, Are you going to the meeting? She said, Yeah, let's go see what it's all about. <laughs> and when we got there, it really, no one really knew what the event was going to be, but that it's important that there be an event. And so we created this together at that table um, at the uh, David Ruggles Center in, um, in Florence. And we haven't seen each other since that meeting. I think there was one more meeting, but I wasn't able to attend. And I, I think everybody did a fabulous job. Okay. Yeah. Um, stay standing, please. Reynolds, get back up. Diane Lieber, Tristram Metcalf, Robert Romer, Carly Tarkoff, David Rosenberger, Carolyn Salem, Steve Stringer, Reynolds Winslow, and Linda, Linda um, Zadie May, and yours truly, Ingrid Askew. Dear friend, Senator Stan Rosenberg. Stan always shows up. Yes. Thank you. And so, it's communities like this, when we come together, we're going to make the change. We just keep doing our work as activists, or musicians, or artists, or whatever it is that we do. Let's continue working together, you know, um, and calling on each other. You can call on me anytime. Dr. Bracey never says no. You know, call on us and let's make things happen uh, and continue to happen in this valley. We've got a great community. Yes. And, um, and we're the ones that make it happen. It can only happen with us. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. It's a gorgeous day. It's my favorite season. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vermont at the Wyndham County Courthouse because the members of the um, Shut It Down Affinity Group have been asked to appear for a hearing uh, related to an arrest that was made at Vernon, Vermont at the nuclear power plant on August 30th. Was it August 30th or first August 30th? Ernest, August 30th. August 30th. 11. So, so here it is. Ago. September 25th, 2012, and we're here for a hearing. And uh, do either of you have anything to say about that? This is Ellen um, Graves here. Well, I have mixed feelings about it. One, if we could get on to a trial that would really work to shut down the Vermont Yankee and bring national publicity and national press to the fact that there are people being tried to shut it down. Um, that I think we should go ahead. If we're just going to have to appear here every year for a hearing, then I don't think we're doing a lot of work into shutting it down. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Francis, do you have any, any thoughts? Well, I think this if is we Francis Crow. had a, a trial that, uh, where we could bring in the expert witnesses, and we could get, I'd like to get Ira Huff and Deb Katz up in the witness stand to talk about what's really going on in Vermont Yankee and uh, the alternatives, uh, then it would be worthwhile. And the only way we f can figure that out is to keep pursuing it, keep trying, and maybe we'll, you know, catch the conscience of somebody along the way. 
Well, we certainly keep doing it, yeah. Oh, but do you feel, Francis, that our coming here once a year for us, that calling us to court once a year, that we're accomplishing that? I don't know, but, you know, we come this far, and I can't wait. You know, I don't choose at this point to ignore it, and I keep trying. So I don't know. I can't read the times. So, you know, slowly, slowly, people are catching up. And uh, I just hope it isn't before there's a catastrophic accident. A tornado or cyclone there on the Connecticut River so that the fuel rods, you know, there are too many packed into a small space and they need to be in dry caskets buried underground in cement or glass deep underground. And until that can happen, they're very dangerous. Yeah. And they're putting, you know, the future of life for everyone in New England at risk. So you mentioned more people catching on. Now, last night you were in Greenfield to hear Dr. Ira Helfan talk about make the connections between Fukushima and the nuclear power plant at Vernon, Vermont. Do you, what's, what's your take on that, Francis? He was superb. He's really under the weight. He did a great job. He spoke with a great deal of passion. He had a, you know, a PowerPoint. And uh, so, you know, I think Fukushima has really awakened him. And he talked about how nuclear power is used to make the nuclear weapons, which has been really his issue. But now he sees that it's nuclear power one of the reasons it was developed was to make the nuclear weapons. And, uh, but what they haven't figured out the, the, what they're going to do with the waste, and uh, they haven't done the health studies to look at what's happening to the people in Wyndham County as a result of Vermont Yankee. And uh, so, you know, it, it's an extremely... Uh, yeah. No, dangerous thing. So he and Deb Katz, Deb was superb. And, you know, they both said we have to f focus on the economics of nuclear power because that's the only thing that really touches many people. Well, it sounds like from what you were saying, Francis, that one of the breakthroughs was this, this solidifying the connections between nuclear weapons and nuclear power, that oftentimes um, through the media and, and even spokespeople have, uh, have really separated them out. But you're saying that, that one of the things Ira Helfand did last night was really punctuate the, the importance of looking at how they are so interconnected. Yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> so that and talking about the fuel rods and that nuclear power is not necessary, that people in Vermont can get all of their energy from solar if we put solar panels on 30 acres of land, we can generate the same amount of electricity that Vermont Yankee is generating. And there are tremendous, uh, there's a lot of acreage in Vernon that they can put the solar panels right there under the grid and take care of the problem of energy in Vermont safely. Well, and I know, Francis, you will continue to struggle for that and speak to that issue. Now, I understand something else happened, that, uh, that on Sunday uh, there was a Quaker meeting, a Friends meeting Friends, at the Nuclear Friends Power Quakers Plant. Friends Quakers in New Hampshire. It's really started by the quarterly meeting in Burlington called Quakers in New Hampshire, Western Mass, and New, and New Hampshire. Uh, to come together for a silent meeting for worship in, at the gates of Vermont Yankee. And 59 Quakers came, and it was a very spiritual, prophetic, uh, 
great at, you know, meeting for worship. And we left our cars at the town hall in Vernon and walked out in silence to the plant where we stood or sat in our chairs for an hour and really tried to make uh, contact with what's going on in the culture and at this time and uh, with that of God in each of us to try to look at what what the situation is of our times. So, uh, excuse me, yeah. And what we could do about it. So this is the first um, faith community that I'm aware of that's done anything at Vernon, Vermont. And um, so you've got, you had Quakers from Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and I think there was someone who came up from, yes, from southern, southeastern Massachusetts. Um, do you think that, that other, other faith communities or interfaith witness at that plant would be efficacious? Well, I've mentioned that to a couple of people, and they said, maybe, maybe, you know, in the interfaith council uh, that brought Bill McKibbins, maybe they would take this this kind of an action on, and it would be great if they could take one step in that direction. To be with Quakers who really, you know, are looking at our lifestyle and our pride and our denial. Thanks, Francis. So here's Hattie Nessel right after our status hearing. But you're going to talk about last night because you also heard Ira Helfand. Well, you know, Ira Helfand, as being a, a physician, being very familiar since 1970s with physicians starting Physicians for uh, uh, Social Responsibility, talked about the effects of um, radiation. And it, 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 he talked about the ongoing daily radioactive releases that we have no idea when they're coming, but they're all harmful. And that in France and Germany specifically, there were long range, credible peer reviewed studies that showed clusters of children, particularly within five miles of a, of a nuclear power plant, that had very high increases of different kinds of cancers, uh, Down syndromes, uh, leukemias, and uh, birth defects. And there's no question whether we understand it in this country or not, because our government refuses to do those tests, doesn't mean they don't exist. And as adults in the community, the reason that we're here in, at court today is because we understand these dangers. And it is criminal, it is totally criminal to allow these, um, to allow these uh, reactors to continue to operate. And he talked about the waste, and Deb Katz talked about the waste. There is no solution, and he never, he doesn't think that there ever will be a solution. And also, the thermally hot water going into the river was discussed. So all in all, we are killing ourselves. And not only now, but uh, for tens of thousands of years, and tens of thousands of generations. So what we're doing here is trying to stop it. And if the law doesn't stop it, it's up to us to stop it. And it's just clear. But you, will we be able to, at the trial, reason, bring no. up the necessity no. of defense?